move on. Okay, cool. So now we're going to move on to talking about a very common group of disorders, and these are known as the upper respiratory infections, or these are sometimes known as URIs. <coughs> and there are several different types of URIs, many of which are not particularly life-threatening, right? Unless it's a man cold, then, then it's, <laughs> then, yeah, it's real. We don't get sick very often, so we got to take yeah, advantage of one time. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, there's something called sinusitis. What is sinusitis? Inflammation infection of the sinuses. Inflammation infection of the sinuses, good. All right, what's pharyngitis? Of the pharynx, good. What's laryngitis? Of the larynx, good. Uh, rhinitis, what's rhinitis? The nose, good. Um, what's tonsillitis? Of the tonsils, good. And then epiglottitis? Yeah, inflammation, yeah. Generally, these are the inflammation is caused by infection. So, as far as life-threatening problems, epiglottitis and tonsillitis can have life-threatening presentations. With tonsillitis, you can develop something called a peritonsillar abscess, right? Where you get a pus pocket that develops in the tonsil, and then it grows, and it can actually occlude the airway. Um, and anyone who has been in the ER and dealt with these, one of the things that we do is we put a needle in them and drain them. That's the emergency, and it is just terrible. It is one of the most terrible smelling things. It's Yeah, it's pretty, pretty rough. Um, so there's that, and then of course there's epiglottitis, and we know that that can compromise the airway as well. Um, interestingly enough, epiglottitis is classically considered a pediatric problem, right? Not really. Why do you suppose that is? Why is it relatively rare in pediatric patients, at least in um, countries like the United States? Yeah, it's fairly. Huh? How do we protect against, what's the, vaccinations. vaccinations, right, the Hib, right, the Haemophilus influenza B, right, which is the most common um, bacteria um, that causes epiglottitis, we vaccinate kids against that, and so it tends to be fairly rare in kids, and fairly rare in populations where, you know, people are vaccinated, but where do we see it? I actually see it more in adult patients. Yeah, because we don't necessarily keep up on our, our vaccines, right? Um, unless you're an EMS student. And you know that. Although the, the, the Haemophilus influenzae B, um, and that's a bacteria, not to, not to influenza, not to mistake that for the influenza virus, different, different things. Um, Hib is a, yeah, a bacteria. Um, yeah, and I've, only, I've, I've seen two cases of this in my career. And they've both been adult adult patients. You know, I've never seen this in a kid. Not to say that it doesn't happen in kids, but you know, there you go. Okay, uh, good deal. So these can all be the result of viral or bacterial infections. Um, some of the upper airway, a very common cause of like tonsillitis, pharyngitis, and laryngitis is what? Streptococcus, right? And this is the also known as strep throat, a.k.a. strep throat. Um, in most cases, however, URIs tend to be viral, right? Tend to be viral, self-limiting infections. <coughs> but, you know, they can be bacterial, and it's hard to differentiate that out in the field. Luckily, it's a fairly easy test. Um, it's called a rapid strep test. You just um, swipe the throat. You go to lab, and it's a, a spectrochemical um, enzyme-based test. It takes about five minutes to get a result, so it's fairly easy to do. Okay, you guys, you guys good with that? So what are general management uh, considerations for these kinds of problems? Supportive care for the most part, right? Supportive care. Um, if airway compromises a problem, you don't want to manipulate the airway unnecessarily. Um, if you suspect something like epiglottitis or peritonsillar abscess, maybe kind of stay away from intubation or any kind of airway instrumentation and just stay basic. Um, in some patients with epiglottitis, you may be able to effectively bag them, believe it or not. You know, bag mass ventilation may be effective, and you really, 
if we're going to intubate these patients, typically we need to take them to the OR and do a fiber optic um, intubation on them because they're very, very, very tough, difficult um, cases. Um, okay, so some other, um, other URI type stuff. Um, otitis, what is otitis? Yeah, the ear, and you have two general types. You have otitis externa, that is the external ear, an external ear infection, and you also get what's called otitis media, and that is inflammation, infection of the middle ear, right? And these are very common. These are much more common in pediatric patients than adults. Why? Well, because in pediatric patients, um, you have a tube, right, known as the eustachian tube, and there's actually another term for it that uh, the uh, station canal or something like that um, that I think people prefer to use. I'm, I'm still old school, so it'll always be a station tube. Um, but it's a tube that connects the middle ear to the throat, right? It empties out into the throat. Um, and in kids, that's still developing. They've got a lot of floppy soft tissue, and it's really easy to occlude that and that leads to an increased incidence of, of middle ear infections in kids, whereas adults, not so much. Um, one thing you want to know about an otitis media, middle ear infection, aside from it can be painful and be uncomfortable, is your patient may also prevent, present with vertigo, dizziness, right? That can put pressure on the cochlea, right? Which is the inner ear, actually, right? And in the cochlea, you have your semi-circular um, canals. And what's significant about the semi-circular canals, you have three of them oriented along the X, the Y, and the Z axes, right? Um, basically three spatial dimensions. And they are responsible for uh, sending information through into the brain via the uh, vestibular cochlear nerve um, about balance, right? And so when you put pressure in that area, i.e. have an infection, that can cause vertigo. So vertigo may occur in people with middle ear infections as well as something called tinnitus or uh, ringing of the ears. Um, occasionally this can go on to develop what's known as a lateral sinus thrombosis where it penetrates into your lateral sinuses and that may be life-threatening because um, there's a possibility, particularly with bacterial, a possibility of it penetrating into the, the meninges and and causing um, problems with, men, you know, say, meningitis and hearing loss and uh, abscesses in the brain, et cetera. Okay, so a common cause, a common bacterial cause of URIs is strep. And strep can cause a disorder known as scarlatina. This is where you get a rash. Um, and this can actually, um, there can be antigen-antibody interactions that can lead to um, problems with other organs of the body. And this is known as scarlet fever, right? It can involve the heart, right? And it can cause damage to the valves of the heart. We call that rheumatic heart disease. It can cause blindness and deafness. And there is a very famous uh, person, um, there are a whole series of books that are written um, from her perspective. I just remember her name now, but um, she ended up getting, I believe as a result of scarlet fever, and she ended up going blind and deaf. Um, I just remember her name now. What about how, how does it affect the kidneys? It can affect the kidneys as well. Yes. yes. I, I think the patient that sure can. Yeah. He had a, a kidney implant. Yep. Because of scarlet fever. Yeah. Child. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. You get these really, con and we'll talk about this more in immunology during med emergencies. But you get these, these, these antigen antibody reactions, and the body uh, responds with a, ma a massive inflammatory response um, against its own tissues. Yeah. So. What's that? Uh, well, no. It, well, there are, no, there are actually some really common, and again, I, I can't really, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but there, we're, we're going to talk about this when we talk about immune, immune reactions, um, but there are some what we call antigen antibody reactions um, that occur 
Um, so, I think so. you wear ankles um, for the little ass. I have my sister, she had strep throat, and uh-huh. she was taking the moxicillin, but we went on vacation. Uh-huh. I That's not good. Yeah, I know. And then she, we got back, and then she decided to start taking it again. So that was like a big imbalance of other kinds of stuff. And she ended up getting oh. started. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. Went away. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it looks crazy. But, so later on, if she had a baby that her, her daughter, she had like what kidney that they're doing with her, she did that kind of sex to it, or? I, I don't know. Probably, yeah. Probably not, yeah. Probably not, but, yeah, maybe. Um, it may actually look like a viral rash, right? And have you, some of you guys have kids, right? And they get sick, and sometimes they get a, a viral rash. And unfortunately, it looks a lot like strep. It's hard to differentiate. Uh, certainly, we can't do that out in the field. So what do we do? Supportive care, transport these patients to, to where they need to go so we can identify what's going on and and get them on the, the, the proper antimicrobial therapy. Um, so that's upper airway infections. You also get lower airway infections, and I'm excluding pneumonia because we've already talked about pneumonia yesterday, but some other ones you want to be aware of, um, bronchiolitis, right? This is also known as tracheolaryngeal bronchitis, right? Or, um, excuse me, just bronchiolitis. Excuse me, sorry. So bronchiolitis involves the <coughs> bronchioles, right? Where are the bronchioles located? Yeah, yeah, lower generation. So between, basically below the uh, main stem bronchi and above the alveoli, right? So the non, some of the non-cartilaginous tissues, you can get inflammation of those. And a very common cause of that is a virus known as the respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Right, very common cause of acute bronchiolitis. We tend to see this more in kids, right? Kids that are less than two years of age. Um, you also have something called bronchitis, which is an inflammation of the bronchi, so the larger airways, right? We've all pretty much get this every year, right? We can get a cold, we get bronchitis. How do they look? They cough, they have sputum, they have some irritation. You may feel a little mild myalgia, maybe a very mild fever. Um, what's the common cause of acute bronchitis? Virus, right? It's almost always viral. Um, so we tend not to, we, we shouldn't be treating this with antibiotics, although, um, unfortunately, yeah, Somebody gets a cough and they, they feel a little down. They're like, oh, I need to go get a Z-Pack. And, um, and azithromycin, we know that that has, in part, um, led to some of the problems that we're facing now with uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, there's also something called tracheolaryngeal bronchitis. Right? So as you might imagine, that primarily involves the, the larynx, the vocal cords. And this is also known as croup. Right. Yep, right, because you have um, supraglottic edema, so you can kind of get that striderous seal barking. Um, you also develop something called pertussis, which is pretty rare because we vaccinate against it. Pertussis is also known as whooping cough, right, and people can have severe paroxysms of coughing. Um, coughing that's so severe can actually cause injuries um, to these patients. Um Cool. You guys good with that? All right. Let's talk about influenza. So influenza is a flu, and the flu tends to be much more severe. Its presentation tends to be very similar to URIs and lower airway infections, but the signs and symptoms are more severe. They tend to have a higher fever. They tend to have significant myalgia. Um, they tend to have significant coughing. They tend to be you know, very weak, uh, very tired, we call uh, malaise, generalized malaise. They just tend to be a lot sicker or a lot more ill in their, their appearance. And we know that influenza can also increase the chance of you developing an opportunistic infection like a pneumonia. And that's often what we see when people that get the flu, um, they may develop a, a concomitant pneumonia. And that's really what where we run into problems is that 
it makes them more susceptible to these. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about influenza. I won't be able to finish it, um, so we'll have to pick it up on Monday when we finish off our lecture. But um, we have three general types of influenza. You have type A, type B, and type C. All right. Influenza A and B tend to present with more severe symptoms. These tend to be more problematic, more severe. And these are the ones that we tend to test for, type A and type B. All right. Influenza type C tends to be much more mild, right? And in fact, it may be indistinguishable from, say, acute bronchitis. You know, you think you have bronchitis and you, you get sick and you don't feel good and, and you get over it when, in fact, you ended up having influenza, right? But it was type C, all right? So, um, what do we want to know in general? Influenza type A is the one that can cause pandemics. And what do we mean by pandemic? What is... What does pandemic mean? Yes, widespread. What does epidemic mean? It's local. So I, um, I sometimes take issue when people say that there is an opioid epidemic, an epidemic of opioid abuse. There is not an epidemic of opioid abuse in this world. It's a, it's pandemic. We should. I, I would like people to use language that really represents the widespread nature of it. But yeah, um, epidemics, and, and there are a lot of people that seem to think that epidemic means widespread, and I think it's just due to um, its, its relative misuse in popular media. Yeah, so pandemic is widespread worldwide, and we've had several pandemics throughout history, right? Um, a lot of flus. Um, yeah, plague, uh, of course, plagues uh, bacteria, but um, still it was pandemic. It wiped out significant population in Europe. Um, in fact, um, the flu pandemic um, impacted World War I, right? 19, was it 1918, right? The Spanish flu um, significantly <coughs> impacted the, the world population, and, and these have actually, ha yeah, have had a pretty, pretty significant impact on societies and things like that. Um, and we haven't really had a significant one since, so, you know, it's something that could happen. Um, type A and B tend to mutate more, um, and that's kind of bad, right? It's kind of bad. <coughs> Why is that kind of bad? Well, because... When we vaccinate, we vaccinate for a certain strain that has a certain genetic code, either RNA or, or DNA, and um, we cause our body to make certain antibodies that tend to be very specific to certain organisms, right? Well, if these organisms are mutating all the time, then it makes it very hard to develop vaccinations against That's these things. Like the, the flu just on what's yeah, so out. basically what we do is, is we, we, we get data from other countries where, where flu emerges from, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times it actually emerges from animals and then it mutates and, and that mutation allows it to cross over to human beings. Um, and so we kind of look um, after, once the flu season ends, so like in the spring, we'll start looking and we'll go, okay, well, what kinds of viruses seem to be more common in the livestock throughout all these countries, and we kind of go, well, this seems to be the trend, and so what we'll do is we'll make a vaccine based on um, the emerging, you know, and sometimes it's very, we're right on, sometimes we're not. In general, it's somewhere around 60% effective, you know, in general, looking big picture. Some years are good, some years are not so good, um, and oftentimes what we do is we will um, have a vaccine that takes into account several strains. And so have you guys ever heard of the term like trivalent? Like this year, the flu vaccine is a trivalent vaccine. What does that mean? Three strains, trivalent, yeah. Trivalent, you know, would be three, three strains, yeah. Um, does that make sense? Cool. Type A can be found in humans and animals, but type B tends to be very specific uh, to, to humans. We don't see influenza B in um, other animals. Um, and I think I'll cut it off there.
because I actually want to go into um, some of the nomenclature for you guys. Like, have you guys ever, like, type um, H1N1? Right, type A, H1N1. What the hell does that mean? Well, we'll talk about kind of what that means and, and how we um, talk about it. And, of course, as you might imagine, it has to do with the proteins that the viruses express on their, their capsid. And, of course, that is a reflection of their their DNA and or RNA because we know some viruses are RNA containing and some are DNA containing and we know that uh, viruses are interesting um, and I will just kind of throw a question at you guys before I head out um, to lunch is a virus alive or not would you consider a virus life or not life well what makes something living you really think about it. What, what, what would you, what would you, what criteria would you use to define biological life? Okay, well, that's kind of important, right? Because most living things reproduce, right, on their own, right? Oh yeah. So, so viruses, they, 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 they are not self-replicating. Yeah, they cannot replicate themselves, can they? What's that? Yeah. So unless it has a host, it can't. Even itself. yeah, and, and and again, it's not even a matter of sustaining, right? For a virus to do what it does, the virus doesn't do anything, right? Even in a host, the host does everything. It's not the virus actually; it's the host that does all the work. Yeah. <clears throat> So I guess the question is, is a virus really alive? But how, would, how does it mutate if it doesn't have something? It uses our, uh, all our protein uh, builders and all. Hmm? It has that instinct to keep going. It's it actually like, doesn't. It's, no, it, it's just... Uh, so a virus is just a particle floating around. It's like a, like, what if I, like a mousetrap. You guys know what a mousetrap is, right? And you set a mousetrap down, and it doesn't do anything until what? Until something hits the little lever, right, and activates it, and then it goes snap. That's exactly what a virus is. It's just a chemical reaction waiting to happen. Yeah, so it's just a little particle, a little particle with these proteins on its, on its shell, on, on the capsid, and when those little proteins just happen to bump in to another protein that matches, that they can lock onto, binds and then it's like a mousetrap it goes whack and then, and then there's a little bit of genetic material inside of the virus and when it does that that genetic material gets injected into the cell and then that genetic material goes to the nucleus of the cell that it's infected and reprograms the cell and then the cell makes more viruses and the mutation occurs during that reprogramming of the, of the cell that's where the mutations occur um, so it's kind of weird when you think about it. The virus is not really alive, is it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it, or it's it's not alive in the sense that we think of life by any means. More like functional might be a better. It has yeah. It has proteins that do something. Um, so. One the way I in the way somebody explained it to me, it it actually makes sense. Um, this is a virologist, a lecture series that I listened to, and he and, and he really um, I think has the best way of looking at it. He says a virus by itself is just a protein particle; it's not alive. But when the virus attaches to the cell, that is considered the virus cell complex then it, that's considered life. So it is something that has both a living and non-living phase to its existence. Weird. <laughs> Weird. Okay, well, let me uh, get you guys out.